The arts of channeling your will into an effect powerful enough to impact and alter reality are arcane at best. There are countless schools of magic who will teach you that theirs is the right way, yet what works for one of the Order of Hermes will be utterly useless to a Verbena. The technocracy will wield advanced devices with ease, yet the same machines will falter in their purpose in the hands of a celestial chorister. One can say, first of all, that there are three types of magic. This helps explain how vampires and werewolves may use their powers, as theirs is a static magic. What this means is that while their powers are supernatural, they are bound by very strict and clearly defined laws that decide what they may or may not do. Barring the creation of new disciplines, gifts and such, static magic has become integrated into reality to a degree, thus avoiding the effects of it crashing down upon them in a wave of paradox. At least, that is how most mages have theorized it. Dynamic magic is what the mages themselves wield, and as the name implies, it is the raw and chaotic energy of changing reality itself, unbound by rules and regulations. The arts wielded by mages are, in theory, unlimited in breadth and depth, yet because they are creatures of reality and consensus themselves, their minds may be too limited by what they consider possible for their true potential to shine through. Thus, they are limited to instruments, rituals, and methods that to them justify and enable the casting of spells. The further along the path of ascension a mage is, the less they need to rely on these crutches as their minds open up to the realm of endless possibility. The downside, of course, is that while the night folk may use their powers indiscriminately without fear of reality lashing out against them, the mages are constantly struggling against a mire of consensus, forced to work along the edge of what is acceptable unless they desire to bring paradox down over their heads. Finally, technomagic is magic, but disguised as scientific tools. Or perhaps it is science, just sufficiently advanced to appear magical. Technomagic does not differ significantly from dynamic magic, except in the sense that the mage, sorry, the technocrat, wielding it is even further shackled to their tools. Any mage may conjure up a bolt of static electricity and sling it at their foe, yet to a technocrat it would be utterly impossible to do this without the specially designed electrocurrent glove prototype that R&D has asked them to field test. Simply put, they are restrained to these tools because they do not believe that they themselves are capable of creating magic. Even as unenlightened individuals fail to wield the aforementioned glove's abilities to store and release balls of electricity, the technocrat will justify this by saying that the user lacked the aptitude, the understanding, or the skills to pull it off. Every awakened individual, mage or technocrat or otherwise, has an avatar. The technocratic union, if they are aware of it, refer to their avatars as geniuses. What it is, is essentially a guiding force conjured up by your awakened soul as a conduit and a guide. It can, in a sense, be compared to the concept of tulpa, a 20th century western occultist interpretation of the Buddhist concept of mind-made bodies. The tulpa is a thought form, some manner of being given life through thought alone. In a sense, an imaginary friend, although that is a gross simplification of the concept and rather disrespectful towards the faith which inspired these occultists. Initially, a mage's avatar is weak, simply a guiding force at the back of their mind that can, at times, provide both inspiration and power. Yet, as the mage continues their journey towards ascension, it more and more becomes a sentient being, a, a representative of the mage's power that can't even be argued with. Some believe that a mage's ascension is when they realize that they and their avatar are one, and they merge together into one perfect being. They say that it is the dissonance between the avatar and the mage that limits their understanding of how to properly manipulate reality. The avatar helps the mage in realizing that the world is composed not of solid things, but of energies and patterns. This energy is called quintessence, 
or quintessence, and depending on which pattern the quintessence manifests in, it becomes different things. The spheres, the different realms of magic, are simply ways to describe the many different patterns that compose all of reality. But for a mage to be able to manipulate these patterns, they will first need to establish their method. The tools, rituals, and in fact, even their worldview all come together to form the mage's focus, their ability to channel magic. It is theoretically possible for mages to work magic without some of their focus, but this is a tremendously challenging effort, and it cannot be done without a firm belief in how reality works. Tools and methods may be discarded with great difficulty for a young magus, but belief, or paradigm as it is called, is fundamentally necessary for any mage to weave magic, even for an advanced arch magus. A paradigm is, simply put, how a mage believes the world to work, their place in this world, and why they are able to cast magic. Belief, while at times coinciding with paradigms, also include a more overarching why, uh, hence it may be necessary to separate the two concepts, uh, lest we muddle the waters. Perhaps a mage believes that creation is a large piece of machinery with multiple complex components that all work in tandem to create the reality around us. The mage then has access to the tools necessary to move, replace, or even destroy some of these component parts. Chaos has no room in their paradigm, all things exist in an ordered way based on some system or even a divine watchmaker. Another mage, meanwhile, uh, may consider reality an illusion, a prison of the mind created to keep us chained and impotent to our true potential. To these mages, becoming unplugged to this matrix-like world is of utmost importance. Humanity can only ascend if they are shown that they are in a cave, and that the images they see dancing on the cave's wall are mere shadows of a reality more perfect and beautiful than we can imagine. Understandably, mages who differ fundamentally in their paradigms will oftentimes find it hard to get along. It's not simply that they have different values or morals, their very perceptions of reality are incompatible. A mage who believes in predestination cannot understand how someone else may think that we are all just modes of chance flickering in a rapid but meaningless existence. For a mage to change their paradigm, it often requires a tremendous effort, a horrifying trauma, or both. Sure, as humans grow up, we may change our worldview multiple times, yet it is rare for us to completely alter how we perceive reality to function. For a mage, this is even harder, as it was their very understanding of reality that caused their awakening, after all. Practice is the art of doing magic. Whether it be through the drawing of complex schematics, the combination of raw minerals and potions, or the perfect application of makeup and fashion, every mage has developed their own unique way of channeling their art. Some mages embrace wholeheartedly Masonic architecture and geometry, seeing God in mathematical perfection, while others may consume hallucinogenic substances to free their minds from the shackles of perceived reality. Alchemy, spoken words, craftwork, these are all methods to magic. There is no true universal way, just as every way is true and universal. Self-flagellation and cybernetics may both produce the same results, despite their differences. The third component of a mage's focus are the tools. Each mage has at least seven different tools in their arsenal that they employ to shape the magic their practice has conjured into the desired effect. These are not necessarily unique items, of course. A mage may use cutlery to bend the perception of reality, sticks of wood to enchant items with mystical properties, or even bodily fluids to exert control over themselves and others. Yet ultimately, it is not a single item, but rather a type of item that serves as the instrument. Still, some mages grow attached to unique items that they wield, and those instruments may, over time, strengthen the mage's ability to influence the spheres. Yet, that is a double-edged sword, as the loss of such a personal tool can severely cripple the wielder. With these three aspects of focus firmly under control, any mage is then capable of exerting their will upon the spheres of reality.
These spheres govern certain aspects of reality, and no mage is a master of all spheres. More commonly, they study two to three of them, often choosing a single sphere as their primary one. Correspondence is the sphere governing connection and dimension. It allows the mage to break down distances, to see far beyond what their senses would allow, and even teleport or ward a certain location from entry. Entropy is the sphere of chance and mortality. Life is heat. Heat is movement. Movement will eventually stop. A mage of entropy knows these principles of physics well, and can subtly influence the movement of reality to alter probability, as well as control decay to a certain extent. Masters of entropy may even alter concepts themselves at a certain level, breaking down their opponent's understanding and perception of reality. Force is a sphere of elements, the manipulation of and creation of kinetic energies. Fire, air, radiation, even gravity itself. In a sense, it is the sphere of physics, and a master of this sphere can even conjure a tornado from nowhere or turn the oxygen around them into a raging inferno. It is a truly destructive power, and one easily turned to offense, although it is not necessarily restricted to it. Life is the sphere of manipulating organic life, whether it be to heal, evolve, or destroy. Through this sphere, a mage can explore what was, what is, and what may be in life, altering the state of biology both in and around themselves. With life, a mage can alter themselves into their ideal self, or twist another into an entirely different branch of the tree of life. Wounds considered fatal can be mended with ease, and limbs thought gone may be regrown. Claws, gills, or wings, nothing is beyond the sphere of life if it is biologically possible. Matter is the sphere of materials. While a life mage may alter the building blocks of life into different patterns, a mage of matter can turn the carbon of your flesh into diamonds, or the gun in your hands into powder. Matter is a sphere that works wonders combined with others, and a mage trained in chemistry and physics is lethal when wielding this sphere. The sphere of mind influences thought patterns and perceptions of other sentient creatures and oneself. It governs skills, memories, the very fabric of consciousness, and mind mages are masters at manipulating their fellow humans. A master of this art considers the body a mere vessel of their self and can possess others with ease, or even transcend their physical body entirely, living on in some other form. Prime is the sphere of quintessence itself, indeed the sphere of potential. Matched with other spheres, it can strengthen their effects, reallocate energy, or take it away. A prime mage can siphon quintessence from around them to boost their own power, and may even imbue items with this power, creating periapts, talismans, or devices. Indeed, masters of this sphere can obliterate a being utterly by simply absorbing all of their quintessence, or dispelling it into the ether. The spirit sphere allows a mage to see, interact with, and even control spirits beyond the physical realm. They may peer into the umbra, commune with the dead, or command spirits of elements or emotions to do their bidding. With enough control over this sphere, a mage may even carve out their own domain in the umbral realms, or trap a spirit in a physical vessel, maybe even destroy a mage's avatar utterly. Time, the last of the nine spheres, governs not only the flow of it, but the perception of it and the branching of it. The ability to perceive outcomes, to see where events will have drastic repercussions, or even exist outside time itself, traveling back and forth through it at their own leisure. Once again, any astute observers will realize that at multiple times, these nine spheres coincide with each other. Some might even have similar effects, merely glanced through a different realm of science or perception. And that, indeed, is the crux of it. Reality itself never created these nine spheres. They were simply formulated to grant the mages wielding them a better understanding of their influence over the fabrics of reality. To a true Master Magus, there are no spheres, just will. And with enough will, you can accomplish anything. Our work has once again pleased the antediluvian Snow, who has risen to oversee it. Long may he reign, this dark god. 
The Methuselah, her satanic majesty Danny, reborn through fire and ice, are likewise worthy of our devotion. We are truly blessed to serve such an illustrious master. The council would also especially thank these primogen for their contribution to its work. Maximilian S. Hardcastle, 06, Stonewolf 18, Jokerman, Cal Constantine, and Bambi Parsons. Your wisdom, experience, and good judgment shall be the torchlight by which we conduct our affairs. Our elders Edward Reed, Dante the Canine, What's That Smells Its Blood, Remy Van Roy, Gaslight 88, and Aubrey Ayers shall receive our gratitude for their support and wise counsel, and we would also wish to send our thanks to the Ancillae Colin Gifford, Harry Wyckoff, Envy Han, and Adam Dahl for their support. Likewise, our stalwart neonates shall, as always, receive our appreciation for their support. And thank you for watching. Reality is within your grasp. All you need is the courage to take it, and the strength to keep it.